Hello, and welcome to Witchy Woman Podcast. I am your host, Danae Sweet, and this is episode 83. Today, we're going to talk about Gerald Gardner. We're going to talk about um, kind of where he come from, how he fits into witchcraft today, and my thoughts about him. (laughs) But this is a topic that was straight from the Witchy Woman Friends Group. I had put up a poll to see what you guys want to hear about. What do you want to hear? What do you want to learn? And the top selection was different kinds of witchcraft, different paths. So I thought I would start with Gerald Gardner. (laughs) I hope that you enjoyed this. It might be a little dry because there's a lot of history. And I love history. I love how everything fits together um, so nice and makes you think about stuff. So it will be pretty dry at some points, but I will try try side try (laughs) to keep it as spicy or at least as interesting as possible before i start i just want to say thank you to everybody who has texted and messaged and emailed um and had had given me well wishes because i've had my neck boo-boo um i'm on the path to mending and i just wanted to say i appreciate it I also want to thank everybody who mentioned or commented or whatever about the last week's episode and me taking a little, like, time to myself to recuperate. I appreciate you guys understanding that. I try my best to be available and, like, accessible to you guys as much as possible, but I do appreciate, so appreciate um, the week off of not researching or building something (laughs) for for that episode. I appreciate it. I needed it terribly bad. And I can tell um, just the level of stress that I have that kind of lifted off me so that I could focus on my health was very much needed and it helped a ton. So thank you so, so much. (laughs) So why I kind of want to just like a brief like little bit about him and then we'll go into like the details. Okay. So Gerald Gardner was born on, this is cool. Friday the 13th of June of 1980 or 1884 um and he he died in 12 February 1964 so he was 80 years old when he died um he is uh famous for making Wicca worldwide um he write, wrote tons of books regarding witchcraft and Wicca and he his claim was this was to keep the old religion alive but something else he was awfully famous for is being a liar and a sexist pig (laughs) he eventually um he did have his own coven to rule and I say to rule because that's pretty much what he did he was not a leader he was a ruler and um so there was a in his Wiccan um coven there was a male and female uh priestess and priests and the priestess was subservient to the male priest and she could only hold the position until she was a certain age in which she had to give up her position as priestess to a younger female and then they would perform the great rite this new young beautiful female uh, priestess which would create would uh, recreate the great rite with him which for Gardner's coven included sex with a newly appointed with with her so so they would have to have sex in front of the whole coven. Um, basically, sex was used as a power play in his coven, which is complete and total bullshit. And it wasn't an option. That's a requirement. Um, to each their own. Like, I believe in sex magic. I think it is powerful stuff. But consent is everything. Um she didn't have uh if you were his priestess you didn't have the option of saying no and keeping your position i think that's bullshit um anyway (laughs) um so gardnerian covens uh did require initiation and they work on a degree system so like you're an initiate and then you work up to eventually like your goal i guess to be in the hierarchy of everything is to become a priest or a priestess and a lot of their information is never shared out of the coven it's secretive even though which i find funny because he was all about publicity he wrote books and published in uh, his little newspaper weekly thingies um so he was all about attention and publicity and talking to the press but he did create a tradition that was supposedly secretive uh okay (laughs) so 
In the 1950s, he wrote the Gardnerian Book of Shadows. I'm going to pause just a second. So I was looking up how you say that. Like, I was like, am I saying it night and or right? And I come up with two different ones. One said Gardnerian, and the other one was like Gardnerian. Gardnerian. So teach whatever, however you want to say it. Um, I looked it up, and different sources had different pronunciations of it. So I guess whichever one you want. <laughs> um... All right, so in 19, the 1950s, he wrote the Gardnerian Book of Shadows, and in it were ordains or laws, that he said had been passed down to him by the New Forest Witches. And we're going to talk about all of this, his history in detail, but I want to give you like a, here's what he's all about first. Um, and there's a lot of debate on whether this is true or he just made shit up. <laughs> um, Doreen Valiente, I'm horrible pronunciations. I probably said that wrong too. Uh, she was one of the coven members and she disagreed with how public he was making the craft and he was, op or she was openly questioning the validity and origin of these Ardanes, which really pissed him off and bruised his ego. Um, she also was very upset with the blatant sexist overtones of said laws <laughs> and suggested they make a new set of coven rules that everyone can agree on, to which Gardner countered with more of what he called old laws, <laughs> which are now they're the Wiccan laws. In 53, Doreen confronted him, and some others did too, like in this meeting with Gardner. Uh, and she told him they thought that he made them all up. And then she cited, she got, went through his 161 fucking rules and went through and found uh, passages that were copied straight from ritual mag magic of Alistair Crowley. Um, one of Doreen's other observations <laughs> were that these Ardanes or Wiccan laws did not seem to exist in the coven until a certain time when people started questioning how he was running the coven and why did they need them now? And these rules, <laughs> he would proclaim law. They, they just, they seemed to pop up whenever it was convenient to him. And it really had his coven members and, and in particularly Doreen, uh, upset. And <laughs> he, I don't know, it, it got bad and there was a falling out, but I want to say there were 161 rules published in his Book of Shadows. And one of these rules was that if you break one of the rules, you're going to be sent to the hell of Christians, which makes absolutely no sense because that's not traditionally what Wiccans believe. We don't, you know, I'm not Wiccan, but there's no Christian hell. There's no punishment for um, bad behavior, that sort of thing. There's, we don't you know, or they don't, as as a rule, <laughs> take on that Christian belief of hell if you're shitty. Um, so anyway, that's like, I guess, a, a very short, this is, this is what he was about. And I wanted to give you that like, short version of who he was, because we're gonna go through the dry stuff. It's not super dry. It's interesting to me, but it does explain um why wicca and and other traditions have a lot it seems to have a lot of other religions stuff in it and included different beliefs different traditions that sort of thing it really really explains that so that's why i wanted to kind of go more in depth and explaining his journey and how this Wiccan, um, how he created his flavor of wicca and he was because he was so um, in love with attention and in love with the press. <laughs> That's why, you know, he's one of the reasons why, um, Wicca and this particular flavor of religion became popular in the United States. He brought that over here, um, through some of his other coven members, um, Buckland, I guess, in, in particular. But anyway, <laughs> so let's start with, you know, who he was, right? He was born into a super wealthy family that made their fortune in timber. Um, so spoiled rich dude, uh, his family was super well off and they traveled all over. Um, and he, he was, I can't remember what order of siblings he was, but, um, anyway, when he was born, they were still traveling a lot and, 
they ended up getting him a nanny. Uh, and her name was Josephine Calm McCombi. They called her Calm. And she mostly raised him. And she even offered to take him to a warmer climate to ease his symptoms of asthma. He had chronic asthma as a child and, and had it uh, throughout his entire life. So um, at the, you know, permission of the parents, she moved him, him to South France. And they traveled all over to tropical islands and countries um but (laughs) it wasn't all super great for him because she it was said that she used this as like man hunting time instead of taking care of him so he was left to just kind of do whatever and we got old enough to be curious he really uh, started throwing himself into learning about the cultures that they were visiting. So that kind of sparked his interest to begin in the in the beginning. So she may have been a shitty nanny, <laughs> but she sparked because of her neglect. He had to entertain himself, and his kind of entertainment was uh, learning knowledge. He throughout his entire life, you can see that theme where he had an insatiable thirst for knowledge, um, probably not second to his thirst for fame. (laughs) But um, anyway, he was an English Wiccan. Um, He's an author, an amateur uh, archaeologist. Uh, He uh, actually was like a government employee, basically. Um, And he lived in uh, British Malaya, or Malaya. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And that includes a set of states in the Malayan Peninsula and Singapore that were under British control between the 18th and 20th centuries. So this is important because during this time, he wrote papers and published a book regarding the native people and their magical practices. So that was like, he started getting very, very interested in that. And it seemed to be the beginning of his interest in the occult and in esoteric um, subjects. Um, He ended up retiring in 36 and moved to Southern southern England where he ended up joining an occult group um, called the Rosicrucian Order Crotana Fellowship (laughs) and I'm not sure if I said that right so we're just going to call it the (laughs) ROCF so the ROCF is a spiritual and cultural movement, and that arose in Ur- Europe in the early 17th century. Um, it's a secret, like, uh, secret thing. So the secret doctrine, I guess is what I want to say, of this order was said to be built on esoteric truths of the ancient past. And these are, like, hidden and passed down, you know, from, um, the, from leader to leader of this um of this group. So the members studied esoteric studies like lectures, books, and plays, and they are all found all prepared to them for them by their found by the founder of the ROCF, and his name was George Alexander Sullivan. Um and he also was thought to be the order uh founder of the Order of Twelve, which sounds kind of like just the prequel to the RO. CF. <laughs> God, I wish they'd have easier names to pronounce. So this was Gardner's, as far as I could tell, like his first real dip into being a member of a big group and practicing uh, magical stuff. So Gardner had developed after a while a pretty good dislike for Sullivan and he, this is so, so ironic, so ironic. <laughs> he he claimed he said that Sullivan was lacking actual knowledge and making things up so so he he it's just funny to me that he accused his first real um leader of not knowing any crap and making shit up and he later was accused of the same thing which is funny to me because he's an asshole and because he was a a sexist pig. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so, um, Gardner also then became involved in what is called co-masonry, which is just a form of Freemasonry that allows both genders to participate. So, he's kind of got his, got one foot in one group and one foot in the other. But, uh, 
after some time and through the ROCF, he made contacts with members of what was called the New Forest Coven, which was named that because they met near New Forest in southern England. So in September of 1939, Gerald claims that he had been initiated into the New Forest Coven and that, and that they were a group of witches that existed during the early 20th century. Okay. So this coven was thought to be a survivor of pre-Christian times and they practiced paganism. Gardner believed that this was a faith that worshipped the horn god and the triple goddess. So we're going to see these themes really start to develop in his personal belief system. Um, And his initiation was said to be held in the home of one of the coven members, uh, Dorothy Clutterbuck. Uh, Research research by Philip uh, Heselton concluded that the members were of, of this coven were Dorothy Clutterback, Clutterbuck, Edith uh, Woodford Grimes, Ernest Mason, Susie Mason, Rosamond Sabine, and Catherine Old Meadow. Those, what he, when he did, he was a, another author, researcher, and he did some study studies and research and found out that this is who he believed was in that coven, the New Forest Coven. Um, the priestess who initiated Gardner was said to be Edith Rose uh, Wor- Woodford Grimes, and he referred to her as Daffo or, yeah, Daffo or Daffo, I don't know. Um, later, because of their friendship and coven connection, Gardner actually walked her daughter down the aisle and is said to have a super close relationship with Edith for, throughout his entire life, um, which was seemed like the only constant besides his wife. Anywho, <laughs> so, uh, so this coven, this coven, it, the New Forest Coven has been debated. The existence of it has been debated a lot and is said to have been made up by Gardner, by some scholars like uh, Aidan Kelly, uh, who, this is interesting, who later founded his own coven and faith called New Reformed Orthodox Order of the Golden Dawn, which was in no way associated with the original Order of the Golden Dawn. But researcher and author, again, Philip Hesselin stated that there is a lot of evidence to back up Gardner's accounts that the coven was actually real. So I don't know if Kelly was just like, wanting to be in the spotlight too and he was like trying to discredit him so he could make his own group i i don't know it seems like petty bullshit to me but (laughs) um so let's talk about a little bit about the new forest coven so one of the most notable and famous things that the new forest coven um claimed to have done was the operation cone of power so and that was in august of 1940 during world war ii the purpose of this was to prevent the high command of Nazi Germany from invading Britain. So Gardner claimed that this ritual was performed naked in the forest by the entire coven and they focused a cone of power toward German leaders and soldiers, delivering a message to them that it wouldn't work. They could not or would not be able to get across the English Channel. And after the ritual, he claimed that some of the weaker, more frail coven coven man, I can't talk today, coven members died as a result of the, of the ritual. Um, and it's actually like, I started looking that up a little bit and there is some corroboration by witnesses and, uh, uh, members that claim to have been a, a part of this coven. So it might not all be bullshit made up stuff. Like when I was doing all the research, it was hard to like decide what I felt was real and what I felt was didn't, wasn't real because I just don't like him. <laughs> So, um, so I'm just giving you this information. You can do with it what you want. Um, Gardner wanted to keep the old religion alive. That's like his excuse for doing anything with anything, it seems like. I did that because I wanted to keep the old religion alive. Whatever. (laughs) He decided he needed to form his own coven in 1946. He did, and he called it the Bricketwood Coven. Gardner, of course, was the high priest, and Daffo, the wish- woman who initiated him in the New Forest Coven, was the high priestess. So uh, she held this title until she left in 1952, claiming his ambitions of notoriety were the reason for her leaving. So instead of focusing on coven and relationships within, he was more interested in talking to the press and, and showing off. So she left. Um, and 
I was wondering, so I'm doing all this research, and you don't hear shit about his wife. Like, like they don't say that they ever separated or ever got divorced through all this, even though he was kind of a horn dog jerk. Um, so, like, I really wanted to know what part his wife had in all of his ambitions with witchcraft, and it seemed she had zero interest in any of it and stayed with him regardless. Um, so in 19... 19- this is this. Ugh. In 1945, he pur- pur- purchased a nudist club called Five Acres, <sighs> and the reason he got to purchase this is because one of his coven members was uh, also members of this nudist club. So that was the connection, and he ended up getting uh, owning these uh, this this acreage. Gardner named one of the cottages on the land the Witch's Cottage, and uh, they're supposedly was like sigils all around the inside of it that decorated it and it just in my imagination it looks exactly what I would think like a witch's cottage like if I was to create some witch's cottage in my mind it's that's exactly what I think it should look like (laughs) I was just reading this kind of visualizing what this witch's cottage looked like and it really I don't know I kind of got sidetracked thinking about it but anyway so during this time uh where he had his own coven the brickwood brickwood coven um he initiated doreen valente and that was in 1952 um and she eventually became high priestess of the coven and she went on to write many books on wicca and 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 witchcraft and she is a whole other subject all by itself (laughs) <laughs> but this but with him and his group is kind of where she got her foot in the door and started doing her own thing okay so I found that Gardner just seemed to have like I told said earlier serious thirst for knowledge and because he did he joined like every organization that he was curious about any group anything that had to do with magic the occult freemasonry he wanted to be a part of it um he was actually ordained as a priest in the ancient british church which is a monotheistic faith um in august of 1946 it's just weird so he has his own coven and he's a priest in here and then he also found druidry interesting and joined the ancient druid or order and there was like a crap load of other stuff that he um joined but he could not like just settle on one and this is all why he still had his own he still had his own coven um on i need, i want to like pause because all of this stuff the druid thing the ancient british church which is you know esoteric christian whatever i don't yeah but anyway he kept pulling as he's going and joining all of these things he's adding and pulling from their religious faith dogma whatever the bits and pieces that he likes and adding it to his own practice as he goes so this is how he is getting all of the information for his own faith that he's kind of building on the fly On May 1st, 1947, Gardner's friend Arnold Crowther introduced him to Aleister Crowley. And he, as you know, or maybe you don't know, he's a ceremonial magician who founded the religion of Thelema uh, Thelema in 1904. Probably saying that wrong too. Um, Gardner and his wife uh, went on like this giant traveling spree after they met Crowley. Um, and they visited places in the U.S. where he learned about voodoo and Native American traditions. And he learned about, uh, I, think he, I think I read uh, somewhere he was even uh, looking into other stuff down there in, uh, in a relationship to voodoo. So, anywho, right before Alistair died, he had made Gardner a fourth degree in the uh, OTO, the or- Ordo Templi Orientis, and therefore he could admit anybody else into the OTO. So he could do the initiation stuff. And during his travels, though, uh, Crowley actually passed away, and this meant Gardner was the new leader and could take control of the OTO, but he got bored with that and <laughs> declined the position, basically, and moved on. He's like, has no attention span it seems like. Um, After that, Gardner wrote more books and started a scrapbook to write down all of his spells in magical notes that he called Ye Book of 
ye art magical. <laughs> That's just weird. Which ended up being the early makings of what he what he called later his Book of Shadows. So uh, because of him, we have the term Book of Shadows. Um, Gardner, this is. <laughs> This is like the stuff he claimed. This is one of the things that people are like, when they research it, they're like, oh my God, what a liar. Gardner claimed to be a master Mason, but according to Masonic records, he's only a first degree Mason. It's like the bottom. He also claimed along his studies and conquests that he was a member of the Scottish Rite. But in order to be a member, you must be a master Mason. Like, really like his history is really just sprinkled with little fibs uh, as well as like pretty big ego boosting lies he also claimed to have a doctorate from a college that they proved never actually existed he he a lot of what he did a lot of his lies i think screwed up the things he the validity of the things he actually did because nobody's gonna believe it's like he cried wolf you know so um after, after, let's see, we, Crowley died, and he went on some more travels. Gardner and his wife continued traveling, and he published more books and articles on magic. Like, he was very pr prolific in that respect. His wife ended up dying in 1960, and he died not too long after when he had a heart attack, uh, the 12th of February, 1964. He left the Witchcraft Museum and all of its artifacts and some of his personal items and copyrights to his books to the High Priestess in the Coven. And she and her husband just sold off the items to Ripley's Believe It or Not a couple of years later. So oh, they obviously, obviously were over him as well. I guess I should like back up and tell you what the Witchcraft Museum was. <laughs> You've totally missed uh, talking about that at all. So it's it's a museum dedicated to everything European witchcraft and uh, magic and it's located in the village of uh, I'm gonna say this wrong Boast Castle or Boz Castle in Cornwall that's in southwest England and it's got all kinds of cool stuff Wicca Freemasonry ceremonial magic all kinds of stuff um, in there and it was actually founded by Cecil Williamson in 1951 to display his actual his actual collection of artifacts, and uh, Gardner actually assisted Williamson at the at the museum. And so after a while, after their friendship deteriorated, after he burned a bunch of bridges, um, actually Gardner purchased it from him in 1954. Um, and he it was originally supposed to be called the Folklore Center of Superstition and Witchcraft, and then Gardner renamed it Museum of Magic and Witchcraft. So he kept all of his stuff in there. Um, and it actually, the date where in it, the year it sold was 19, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, so it was just, it, to me, it's just another way for him to feel important to to display his wonderfulness <laughs> upon the world um, and have his own freaking museum. So I guess we owe him, um, we do owe him a lot because he really, you know, he really pushed the neo-paganism movement. He got it to spread over here to the United States where we put our own flair to it and anyway if you want to look up his 161 rules rules i'm going to put the link in the show notes so that you can look up and read his ridiculousness also you can see the whole video that millennial incantations did about his freaking rules like they're ridiculous rules they're not relevant to today they really were just misogynistic Ugh, word puke but if you really want to hear all of them in a really funny way <laughs> please check out millennial incantations video it is hilarious and also educational because it shows how far we have come and i for one am thankful for that <laughs> so this was gardnerian uh wicca and it is just an installment of a bunch of them that i will do um there are all kinds of different flavors to this to me, this is the most, if you go by their original rules and how he ran it, it was very sexist and um, excluded, you know, everybody except for, you know, white dudes. So, 
Anywho, I hope you found this educational and it's history. It's history of like, I'm not Wiccan, but this is still history of my practice because um, like the first thing I learned about was Wicca because that's what's out there. That's what's on the internet. Like when you look up witch, like there's shit loads of Wicca sites. And when I was younger and even in college there were you know chat rooms we had AOL chat rooms and that's where I got to meet you know sort of you know other fellow uh, witches and I learned from that, that interaction that you know Wicca isn't the only way and that's why I you know started researching other things is because you know I didn't know there was anything else really I thought that Wicca was the only thing so I do owe Wicca my beginnings if I hadn't discovered that and I did appreciate at that time I kind of needed rules <laughs> and some kind of structure and it was something that brought me comfort and I do see the value in uh, my roots that's those are my roots my roots are in Wicca um, and it's a, it, my, my practice is always evolving like I'm an eclectic pagan witch, technically, um, and I take what resonates with me, but a lot of my practice does come from Wicca. And because Gardner was a giant, you know, egotistical asshole, um, he got the word out. <laughs> he, he wrote about it. He got it out there. He got it to the U.S. He was obsessed with the press and getting everything out and about and... For that, I am thankful. I mean, he might have been an asshole, but, but without him, I don't know as if we would be, we would have Wicca, we wouldn't have had it as soon as we did. Um, we probably would have had it, I know. But, you know, he was a loudmouth. So, so we have it. Anywho, there's tons and tons of other people that were involved in in his evolution and the evolution after his death of Wicca and other forms of witchcraft, and which we will talk about <laughs> and let you know about. Um, I thought maybe because it goes hand in hand, I'll go with Alexandrian uh, Wicca next, and um, we'll talk about uh, Dianic Wicca. Um, and I'm not sure how if that's probably the as many forms of Wicca that I want to dive into. Um, and then maybe just talk about different paths, different uh, other traditions. So we have we have the, the Wiccas. And the reason I want to go through those is because each, to me anyway, each one of those flavors sort of uh, borrowed from each other or built upon each other. So there's a lot of shared beliefs and, uh, and systems and rules and stuff like that. So I kind of wanted to talk about those because it all fits together like a little puzzle piece. And then I thought we'd talk about different traditions. Um, we'll talk about, um, I'm still working on trying to find somebody that's a, that's an Italian witch. I would love to talk to somebody who, who is, has that lineage. Um, Native American traditions, anybody who practices voodoo, hoodoo, whatever, that is a family thing or, a, or an ancestor to pass down type tradition, please, please, uh, please email me at witchywomanpodcast at gmail.com um, and let me know if you'd like to talk to everybody about your, your practice. Um, anywho. So I guess that's all I have for today. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, and, and perfect timing too because the dude next door is having his mo lawn mowed. So it's about to get super loud when he gets done with that section. I want to quickly um, remind you guys that we have an amazing trio of sponsors and they have some stuff going on. So Shelly Leggett of uh, Lavender Potions has some big things happening um so check out her site and she is doing mediumship classes and she has a really big thing in her back pocket right now that she i'm sure will share with you um so go to her website lavenderpotions.com uh rena dwelly has a brand new uh key out and she's doing this 
with in like a corroboration with Brandy Burrow, one of our other sponsors. Um, so they have some amazing stuff for Virgo season headed to you. So head out to their sites as well. You can find them on Facebook. You can get them in the show notes. And if you go to my website, witchywomanpodcast.com and click on sponsors, each one of their sites and information are linked there. Um, he, yeah. Oh, I have a quite a few other little, um, affiliate things that people have contacted me about and you can go to my um like if you're on instagram go to my bio and uh, all that stuff will pop up and you can click on it um right now i'm obsessed with bones coffee and uh so yeah so that's a link (laughs) man i'm bad at this like my like there's no wonder i don't have like a big advertised mean like company wanting to sponsor me because I'm really bad at advertising so put that on my planner for something to work on right (laughs) okay guys thank you very much to everybody again who sent me um positive vibes and was checking on me make sure I'm okay um I'm okay I got meds and I'm on I'm on the med so thank you thank you thank you thank you okay guys That's it. So I guess until next time, stay witchy. Bye-bye.